when I was a young kid, you know, I, I used to enjoy coming home from school and, and helping as much as I could and look forward to it. But anymore, it, it's not fun, you know, not when you're looking at water coming at you. This is a man-made deal where, you know, I can understand natural disasters. That's a different story, but this thing maybe could have been prevented in my eyes. Well, it's frustrating because people don't know whether the water's coming in or if it's not coming in, or, and they're basically they don't know what to do. You know, they're just waiting to see what the Corps of Engineers is going to do up north. For countless generations, families have worked the rich bottomlands of the Missouri River. It was not always an easy life. Cycles of wet or dry, flood or drought, boom or bust. But the privilege of turning over some of the most productive ground on earth kept most farm families rooted close to the river bottoms, waiting for that next good year. But something in that natural cycle changed. The river began to rise. It was a dry spring in the Midwest, not a cloud in the sky, but still the river rose. It overtopped levees, destroying crops, destroying towns, devastating lives. This was a disaster, but was it a natural one? Could it have been anticipated? Could it have been prevented? Did the flood of 2011 have to happen? This is the Gavin's Point Dam, the lowest of six main stem dams on the Missouri River. Coming over the top of this dam are 150,000 cubic feet per second of water. That's down from a high of 160,000. And these flows lasted for weeks, months. With little or no rain in the lower basin, all of the flooding on the lower 700 miles of the Missouri could be traced right to these record flows. Dave Becker is the operations manager for the Gavin's Point Dam. The most water we had ever released from Gavin's Point Dam before this year was 70,000 cubic feet per second in 1997. But the water we're releasing from Gavin's Point Dam this year, which peaked at 160,000 cubic feet per second, is over double what our all-time record was. If you look at our, our total water flow from Gavin's Point Dam right now, and you were watching a football game, and a football field's about an acre in size, the amount of water we're letting through the dam right now would put about three and a half feet of water on that football field every second. One of those suffering from these record-breaking high water releases is Holt County farmer, Eddie Dravis. It was a very disheartening feeling, you know. All the work we went to to try to keep the water out and then all of a sudden, just like, you know, it just kills you. Dravis has been particularly hard hit. Not only was his corn crop devastated by these record high water releases, a subsequent tornado destroyed the roofs of his chicken houses. And of course, with the high water, repairs were impossible. Oh, it's, it's tough. I mean, knowing that the water's coming, just that anxiety of knowing it's coming and how deep it's going to get, just, it, it makes you just almost mad, you know, knowing that it wouldn't have to be that way. We had a flood last year, and last year it was here almost 30 days total. This year we're looking at months on end. I mean, the more levees break north of us, the longer it's going to be before it goes down. You know, it's about survival, and it's going to be tough. It's been a family farm for about four generations at least, so you may not be able to stay in the family, you know. To understand these unprecedented releases, 
You have to understand the enormity of the system above Gavin's Point Dam. In the late 1940s and 50s, the nation threw its post-war energy into taming the Missouri River. Six main stem dams and reservoirs were created. They were giants, the biggest in the country. Together they can hold over 73 million acre feet of water. It was a dramatic transformation. And the entity tasked with the design, implementation and maintenance of these epic public works was the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. But with this system of dams put in place to control the river, did this flood have to happen? According to the Corps, it did. Colonel Robert Ruck is the commander of the Corps' Omaha district. We had a year here where we had lots of snowfall on the plains, but really what, what really was the kicker was the amount of rain up in uh, Wyoming and, and into uh, Montana. We had lost the room that we had saved in the reservoirs for it. So that, that forced us to up the releases and you know we're to this historic level where we are now. Of course, Missouri farmers are no strangers to a weather forecast. Even given the unusually heavy rains and snow in the Northern Plains, questions remained concerning how the capacity of the Missouri River Reservoir System is utilized. To the, uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, they will uh, indicate that they had to do it this way to protect the dams. Uh, the thing is, maybe they should have started releasing a little earlier. Uh, we wouldn't have had this much water all at once. Our foot lower than what it is now, uh, we would have saved some levees. We wouldn't have had to work near as hard as, as you know, the last week and a half of what we're doing. You know, it, it wasn't the best conditions. When the Belcher Lozier Levee in Carroll County, Missouri began overtopping, an epic flood fight began. Spearheaded by local residents, hundreds of individuals were able to shore up the failing levees and hold the river back. These emergency measures continue to require vigilant maintenance. With constant pressure on the levees, sand boils or animal burrows could prove a devastating weak link. It was a heroic effort and ultimate success. Thankfully so, because the consequences of failure were enormous. And if these levees would all broke in here, if just the Carroll County bottomland alone, there would have been 79,000 acres affected and about 50% beans, 50% corn. And we placed a value on that at today's prices of 58 million. So that's not including the the destruction to the roads, the homes, uh, just lots of things that, that can happen here with these floods. The effects of these high water releases went far beyond the agricultural community. With Interstate 29 flooded out both above and below Omaha, north-south travel and commerce effectively ground to a halt in the middle of the country. Every small community along the Missouri River felt the effects of this flood. There's not a lot of jobs to be had around here, and this is one of the bigger employers in, in a, a short area around here. And, you know, right now we got the whole town next to us evacuated in, in preparations of losing their homes. The water's starting to creep in around our town, and all our electrical equipment, our electrical pumps, as you'll see, they're gone. We've had to pick them up and move them up to higher ground. So we're expecting the water coming in, and as we can see out around the plant, it's coming and our, our highways are starting to be underwater and we had to get the stuff out before we couldn't even get in here anymore. When you shut down a facility like this, and we're a small plant, we're a small uh, community plant, and yet we're the largest employer in this county in terms of payroll. So this is a major economic hub for this county. Through the last three weeks, four weeks, as this event has been unfolding and kind of gradually coming, as I talk to the people here, I can feel it in their voice. They can feel their apprehension, their stress level, their anxiety, sometimes depression, the futility of what can I do. We're concerned that the Corps of Engineers needs to have someone really put some pressure to protect the downriver area. This is not the first occasion that we've had a flood threat in this area. It has dramatic widespread economic impact. 
That economic impact is about more than numbers. It's about lives. As the water continued to rise, the convenience store in Craig, Missouri, couldn't hold out any longer. Uh, well, I'm closing tonight because they have redirected traffic up 71 Highway and the people have moved out of town and there's not enough people here to, um, for me to stay open. Uh, including myself, I employ 10 ladies here at the store and they depend on this for their livelihood. Some of those ladies still have young children at home that they're trying to educate, so I have no idea what's gonna happen to those ladies. In Corning, Missouri, the releases from the Gavin's Point Dam overwhelmed the local levees. The consequences of the resulting inundation were deeply felt within the heart of the community. Well, this town was formed as an outlet for the railroad when it came through back in the 1800s. Then in 1893, they built this structure here, and uh, it's uh, served this congregation extremely well. You come in here and you, you know, you take your hat off and you cross yourself and, uh, and you go from there that there's a, uh, a, lot, of, a lot of family uh, uh, thought and feeling and emotion involved. Uh, everything circled at that time and still does today around the church. There's been water in here before and uh, the church is not foundation and walls, it's, it's the people, so we go from there. I do sleep well at night for the most part. You know, I, I feel for the people who are flooded out and the economic impacts to the farmers and the fields that are flooded, but I do believe these flows would have been much worse if we did not have the system in place that we have right now. We didn't cause this flood, we've controlled this flood. We've really tried to reach out, but you have to have it, you know, an open audience that, that's, that's listening. And, it, you know, it's very hard when you're the one getting flooded out to, to dial into Facebook and, and, you know, and look up that data. As the events of the spring of 2011 are examined, two things become abundantly clear. First, is the profound disconnect between the individuals tasked with managing this river and the people whose lives are affected by their decisions. Second comes the overwhelming reality that though we cannot control the weather, ultimately we do manage this flood control system. This man-made flood is something that we can never let happen again. Many farmers downstream of the dams have experienced flooding for three of the past four years. Clearly, something needs to change. Flood control has to be the number one priority. We have not had any local rains. All of this water came from up north with the snowpack and the rains up in Montana and Dakotas. And the, the, the reservoir system up there was put in for flood control and it should have been able to hold this, this much precipitation. It's a lot of questions that I'd like to see the Corps of Engineers answer and hopefully all the delegation in the river basin states can get together and, and change how things are operated, you know, until this doesn't have to happen in the future. The, the biggest thing is just irritates me knowing that this would not have had to happen because, you know, run the dams lower, you know. It's not all about recreation, it's about livelihoods, people's family businesses they're not running right now and it's it's more it's this is just a little part of it there's thousands upon thousands of people out of their homes right now and it wouldn't have to happen so we need somebody responsible enough with some common sense up there to run the lake levels like they should make their docks a little maybe a little bit longer to get to the water if that's what it takes you know because we can't survive this we just can't survive it. <laughs>